from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I want to welcome you all here today for this open mic series. The open mic series I actually like to think of as a tributary of the Bakken lectures. Um, it's a little bit more informal and discussion oriented and allows us to have conversations with artists, with leading scholars and researchers who are working in folklore, ethnomusicology, cultural heritage studies and the like and oral history, as we're going to find out more about today. Um, it is also a, a great strategy for us to increase our collections and build our collections. This discussion today will be um, taped and will become a permanent part of our archives and will eventually make its way onto our website so that individuals around the room, <laughs> around the room, <laughs> around the world, a little bigger room, uh, <laughs> and individuals in the future will be able to listen to this. So with that said, if you do have any devices turned on, like the cell phones and the like, please turn it off um, right now, I'd appreciate it. So today we're having a little focus on StoryCorps. StoryCorps is a partner of the American Folklife Center and it was founded in 2003 by Dave Isay and started as a, a um, booth, recording booth in Grand Central Station and now has turned into this beautiful airstream that is parked behind the Jefferson Building right now. And since 2003, or actually since 2005 when they became mobile, um, they have been traveling around the country documenting, interviewing, or allowing in individuals to come together and interview each other and share their stories. And all of these stories are actually uh, deposited in the American Folklife Center. So today, among all of the collections we have, today we don't really have many um, interviews with the individuals who do the interviewing. So today we are going to do switch or turn the tables here um, and have an opportunity to hear what interviewers and what the interviewers from StoryCorps have been doing over all these years, uh, roaming around and traveling and how they learn to do what they do and their experiences along the way. And I want to thank StoryCorps. I also want to thank WAMU, who is a partner with this residency here um, with StoryCorps, who will be here until about mid-May. They've already been here a couple of weeks, so we're thrilled to have them and thrilled to be a partner. And I'm going to turn this over to Nancy Gross, American Folklife Center Folklife Specialist, who will tell you a little bit more about the individuals that are going to be talking. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Betsy. <clears throat> and thank you all for coming. So uh, established in 2003, StoryCorps is one of the largest oral history projects of its kind in the world. In 2005, StoryCorps converted an Airstream trailer into a traveling recording stu studio, which you call the mobile booth, right? And launched its first cross-country tour, visiting cities and towns across the country to record stories of the American people. Partnering with local radio stations, cultural institutions, and community-based organizations, StoryCorps invites pairs of participants to spend an hour in the mobile booth recording their stories. Each week, millions of people listen to excerpts of these compelling conversations on NPR's Morning Edition. How many people here listen to NPR's Morning Edition? Ah, okay, there you go. And there's also the StoryCorps Listen page. Uh, in recognition of its activities, the Brooklyn-based nonprofit has already received numerous awards, including two Peabody Awards, and in 2015, its founder, David Isay, received the TED Prize. Uh, in 2015, it also launched the StoryCorps app, uh, an innovative tool for collecting stories that we're going to be talking ab about today. But before we get there, I want to introduce the four StoryCorps um, members, staffers who have been nice enough to come. I'll start with uh, Naomi Bletch, 
who began her work with StoryCorps' mobile tour after earning a degree in sociology from Barnard College. Um, uh, Naomi's all the way at the end. A as a facilitator, Naomi strives, according to what's on the web page, and we always believe <laughs> the web page, to create a space for all individuals to meaningfully share their stories. Uh, she's particularly interested in the intersection of personal narratives and ethnographic research. Right. Um, Talia Cooper um, is the archive manager at StoryCorps and has been with the organization st since 2007. Uh, she holds a master's in library and information sciences from Pratt Institution and a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Barnard. Uh, Felix Lopez began his time at StoryCorps in the prints and animation department before starting his current role as a bilingual mobile facilitator. Uh, prior to earning his, uh, prior to working with StoryCorps, Felix worked in art and education, I'm sorry, worked in arts and education administration, is that right? And uh, he earned his bachelor degree in Chinese uh, language and history from the University of Michigan. And finally, uh, Stacy Todd is a native of Michigan and uh, claims you, you've sailed extensively on the Great Lakes. You put that on your bio. So we're, we're <coughs> since that's what you wanted to be known for, <coughs> we're, we're quoting exactly why we're here. <coughs> she earned her bachelor degree in linguistics from Brooklyn College, and she's been with StoryCorps since 2013. And um, you all, now let's see, three of you, um, Stacy, Felix, and Naomi, are facilitators with a mobile booth, and Talia is here from the Brooklyn office where you're less mobile, is that right? Yes, I'm, I'm immobile, um, <laughs> but, I, but I work with the archive, so that's what brings me, that's my connection here. You're mobile today. Yes. <laughs> so this, in some ways, sounds like a fascinating job. So we're gonna to talk to you just about what it's like to actually go around the country and, and record stories, uh, and uh, what it's like to also make them available, because it's not just recording them, it's sharing them with the people, it's also getting them on media so people sort of uh, value the stories, and then of course, from the Library of Congress's view, getting them to the American Folklife Center so that they become part of the permanent narrative, the per our permanent collection, our permanent archive, and part of the record of the American people. So uh, let me start with sort of a softball question. I actually, I just went back a minute for all, all of you, how did you hear about StoryCorps? Um, and did you were you always interested in listening to stories? Yeah, yeah, why don't you start? So you've, uh, you've been with StoryCorps how long now, um, Naomi? I started as an intern this past June, so I guess it's coming up on a year now. Uh -huh. But this is actually my first stop on the mobile tour, so I've only been um, recording with the mobile tour for about two weeks now. Uh, yeah, so I m probably won't have that many stories if, if that becomes your question, but um, I heard about StoryCorps after graduating um, with a bachelor's in sociology and sort of being interested in nonfiction, creative storytelling in different ways to um, amplify the voices of marginalized or disenfranchised communities, um, both to empower those individuals, but also to share those narratives and make them a part of our historical record. And, and how about you, Felix? How did you hear about this? Um, so I think I was still in education, and I was doing a lot of education with museums. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts at this point, and I was really in tune with storytelling based on my Caribbean family. Um, we just, over celebrations or whatnot, I would just tell a story and it with descriptions, and it's this art of really celebrating life. And I really got in tune with not just history, but oral history um, when I got into Chinese language and culture and how um, in tune that culture is to storytelling with its long history. And I wanted to get involved with the organization that not only tells the history, but kind of changes the narrative and gives it back to the people and gives them ownership of what they want to say and how they want to say it. Um, and that's when I got into StoryCorps and I saw, and I've been, I interned with them this past June, so it's almost coming up to a year, um, and seeing the different facets of what StoryCorps does and not just seeing it in the broad, uh, broadcast light, but all the different perspectives and uh, missions that StoryCorps does to amplify the voices of everyday Americans. Now, how about you? 
Sure. Um, let's see. I've always been a people person. Um, I've always been all very curious, ask a lot of questions. Um, I had a non-linear path to school, so I was in the service industry for 10 years, so I'm a big customer service person. I ended up working um, at StoryCorps for two years in the public information and services department. Um, so I was the person that people uh, went to when they had questions, which people have a lot of questions about StoryCorps. Um, so I, I worked very closely with um, Talia in the recording and archives department, the education department, you know, all of our different booths across the country, fielding questions, sending organizations towards them. Um, but then in January of this year, I started on um, as the manager of the mobile booth. Um, but yeah, I studied linguistics in Brooklyn College, and that did not lead me necessarily to StoryCorps. <laughs> I, I needed an internship in my last semester of school, so I was an intern at StoryCorps. Like as Which is in Brooklyn, it's yes. in downtown Brooklyn. Yes, right? in yes. Fort Greene. Um, it's a fantastic place to be an intern. They're very um, in demand, these internships. A very large number of StoryCorps staff members were interns. And yeah. they just train up through the organization? Yeah. It's a six month, um, five day a week commitment, a, a StoryCorps internship typically. Um, so I th yeah, I think, th Talia, you were not an intern, right? Three, the three of us um, that are on the mobile tour were interns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine was um, from June to December of 2013. And, and Talia, you, how did you get connected with StoryCorps? Oh wow, uh, I've been with the organization for eight and a half years, so it's a little bit fuzzy to remember, <laughs> but... How um, many people worked for StoryCorps in 2007? Probably less than half the number of people that... Yeah, how many people work for StoryCorps now? About 140 people work at the organization. We have um, locations or across... The, so in addition to the mobile tour, we have in our office in New York, we also have permanent recording locations in Chicago, Atlanta, and San Francisco, and staff at, at all of those sites as well. Um, yeah, I came to StoryCorps um, kind of from a three-pronged interest in being an archivist and coming to work with a really cool collection. Um, I've also uh, worked in, I'd worked in radio and audio and music stuff, so I was just really interested in sound and sound reporting. Um, and then I also uh, came from a background in social sciences and ethnography and, and kind of the uh, minutiae of everyday life and getting to be a part of kind of bearing witness to that and preserving that is something that's always been really appealing to me. So can, can one of you walk us or several of you walk us through what happens in a StoryCorps interview? How, how, how do people sign up? How do you get people to come there? And then how do you, how do you walk them through what they're going to do? Because one of the interesting things for me as a as a folklorist is that your model is not to have someone who's a professional interviewer do it, right? It's to have people who know each other and most, most of whom have not done this sort of thing before. Yeah, we prefer if it's not scripted. We prefer if it's not interviewers because that's not the StoryCorps model. The StoryCorps model is a 40-minute conversation uninterrupted um, with somebody that you know. Um, but I'll start with the process. People make a reservation for an appointment. I am sorry to tell you that all of our appointments are booked for Washington, D.C. Um, you can get on our wait list if you'd like to be on the wait list. If you're going to be in D.C. Um, for you know the rest of our time here, we'd be happy to have you on our wait list. Um, but yeah, you need an appointment. So for the way the mobile tour works, a couple weeks before we get to town, our appointments go live on our website and people can make an appointment. It's a free public service. Um, so you sign up for an appointment, you need to have a partner, um, and then one, one of our, the staff members from our office will call you and make sure that you understand what you've signed up for mm -hmm. and um, that you have a general idea of what you're going to talk about. We, we prefer that you don't know exactly what you're going to talk about, but you have a general idea. So you have a date and a time for your appointment, and then you... An hour exactly. An the, hour we, the appointment takes about an hour, but you have 40 minutes of uninterrupted recording time, um, so you show up, we ask you show up 10 or 15 minutes early, you fill out um, a data sheet, which is just how we build a profile of our participants in the archive. 
But I don't, do you want to take it from there, Felix? What happens after? Sure. Um, once participants come in, um, we tell them to come in about 10 minutes before their appointment time. Um, and a facilitator, either me or Naomi, will come in, will come outside um, and introduce ourselves. And they'll fill out a participant data sheet, which is just to build a profile uh, for StoryCorps. But usually what we tell them is what's the most important part about the data sheets, because there are some questions that for some people may be um, very uh, particular and they might be a little uncomfortable, is that all those questions that they fill out are optional. Um, they could fill out as much or as little as they like. Um, and so after they fill out the participant data sheet, they come into the booth. Um, and it's always interesting seeing their different reactions to the booth. Oh, it's quaint, or it's cozy, or do you live here? Or it's bigger than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> or it's bigger than I expected. Um, and from there on out, we um, situate them and make them feel as comfortable as possible when we get into the recording um, part. Because there's two rooms within the Airstream trailer. There's one where we, where we the facilitators, da database. And then the other, the other room is the recording studio. Um, and then we really start talking to them a little bit about what the process looks like. Um, within that 60 minute appointment, 40 minutes is of uninterrupted um, conversation time. And f the facilitator is, we're only there just really to make sure the sound quality is okay. We're gonna be jotting down notes, um, summarizing um, the conversation every few minutes or so. And then also like, we may have some questions sometimes, but really it is the time for the participants that are there to really um, talk about whatever they want. And par participants talk from love to um, someone in their family that just passed, um, recent proposals. Uh, I had a proposal in the booth <laughs> yesterday, a few days ago. <laughs> so do you want to- Did she say yes? Yeah. She did say yes. <laughs> do you want to continue from there? Yeah, sure. I like to say that I might ask some clarifying questions, like if they bring up Bob and you've never brought him up before, just for archival purposes, I would say who's that? Or to invite participants to explore an area or a topic a little bit more. And in that case, it's obviously always optional. You know, it's, a, it's an appointment between the two of them to, to archive their stories together. Um, so they can always skip that. But I think that you can sort of tell if they're gonna be receptive to a question like that, and it's often something that can enrich the experience. So I feel very privileged to be able to ask those questions every once in a while and sort of spark some something in the conversation that, that might have gone overlooked. So I think that's one of the coolest parts of the job. And then at the end, we um, we stop the recording, we give them you know 10 minute, five minute, one minute hand signals. Um, and then we give them a CD of their recordings to take home that day, which is really neat, um, and we, invite them to archive their story with StoryCorps and at the Library of Congress. Um, it's definitely very optional. They can, the release forms range from walking away with the only copy of a CD to archiving at the Library of Congress, um, some of our partner archives at the Smithsonian, um, or to just archiving at the Library of Congress and not giving StoryCorps access to your content, to produce for radio potentially, which is only less than 1% of, um, of the stories but or to use for educational or promotional purposes and things like that. But a lot of people are really excited by sort of how easily they were able to open up or what came out in those 40 minutes and are excited to archive it. So that's also something that's really neat. And then we take some photos for the archive, um, some group photos and some individual photos, and we give individuals the opportunity to make a small donation to StoryCorps, and that's about it. I was just going to say that the, we refer to the recording space as a sacred space, and people are often surprised by how quickly they are able to make themselves vulnerable um, or share something that they've never shared before, or how easy it is to ask a question of somebody who, you know, you've never asked that question before. Is that because of the physical space, or does the, uh, it's an event that they've signed up for? And they it's a combination to? of all of that. I definitely think the physical space helps. It's very dim inside the booth. Um, just two lights over the participants, the light that w near the facilitator is usually turned off. It's pretty cozy. The booth seats are really worn in. The way it's set up is like a booth at a diner. Yeah, we need new cushions, <laughs> which we're getting. But, um, you know, we have limited resources, so if our booth seats are a little squishy, that's why. Um, but no, I think that it is, think of, we have, the mobile tour has been traveling the country since 2005 nonstop. So, 
think of all of the thousands of people who have sat in that space and had a moment or shared something, you know, lo there are lots of tears. People always say that they cry during our broadcast. Well, there's a lot of crying in the booth, <laughs> but it's happy tears sometimes, of course. Like, people share traumatic things. It just, you can, the, the space has an energy to it. And I do think that the space um, contributes to the quality of the conversation. Now, can, now, can you guess what people are going to talk about by as they come in, by the way they carry themselves, the way they look? No. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. G give me an example. I think um, I could like even give an example from something that happened yesterday. Um, someone from an outreach organization came in, and it was uh, her and her husband, and they were very. I mean, they were giddy and happy and excited, but I think you can't really assume, one of the things about being a facilitator is that you really can't assume what people are gonna come in with or peop what they're gonna say or what the conversation's gonna be like. Um, and so it's kind of like just, when you're meeting a new person, for me, I feel like when people tell their stories, always a present for me, because I'm, be, I'm humble in a space where I'm part of your life for 40 minutes and I'm hearing things that not a lot of people can hear or will hear in their lives. And especially when with two people that are so personally connected, I think life is life and that we have errands to run and we have things to do that we never have the space to have those conversations or we really avoid those conversations sometimes. Um, and so with the space, that, that sacred space that Stacy mentioned, there is that time where people are like asking those questions and you, there's nowhere to go. It's like, you're gonna <laughs> say, you're Wait. gonna. People can leave if they, they can, want. They can <laughs> leave. But Wait, that's one thing we tell people yeah. is you have 40 minutes and people usually use it all yeah. and it usually goes really fast, yeah. but you don't have to use it yeah. all. You if at any to. moment you feel like you're finished, you can give us a signal and we stop the recording. Exactly. But <laughs> it's like, not like, oh, you, but like, I feel like with it, when it comes to a very personal conversation, when someone asks a question, you feel like this is the time where I'm archiving this and this is the only time I'm gonna talk about this, why don't I answer it now? And so when th that couple came in, they just started talking about their grandma, uh, the, the woman started talking about her grandma, and by the second or third question about talking about her favorite memories with her grandma in Ukraine, she started to cry and, and talking about being a Ukrainian woman in the United States. and. Um, traveling and immigration, and I couldn't assume all that stuff just by seeing her fill out a, participa a, par a participant data sheet or saying hello. So there's always those little bouts of surprises that come in when you're a facilitator. You mentioned outreach organizations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people don't realize how much thought goes into who you're interviewing. Yeah, so a few months before we, um, before our scheduled stop, we start in the office doing outreach on organizations that are working with um, populations that are underrepresented in the media or in our archive. Um, we have different initiatives um, for L the LGBTQ community, for Latino voices, for African and African American and, and Black stories, for um, am I forgetting any military for voices. military voices? We we try to. We try to do special initiatives to incorporate voices that we are noticing. We notice that we are um, represent. We are in need of. But besides that, so we'll we'll do research on on the upcoming stop. We'll look at the demographics of the stop, and we'll reach out to nonprofits, you know, community-based organizations, just individuals who we think have a lot of connections in the community, and we'll invite them to a community partnership meeting, which happens about a month before the stop, where one of our colleagues from the office travels to the location um, and meets with um, potential point people from those organizations to tell them what a story core partnership looks like. Um, and then if they decide that they want to be partners with us, they'll get access to a private calendar um, where they can reach out to people within their networks and sign them up for appointments. So about half of our um, appointments and more than half in Washington, D.C., go to people who wouldn't have been able to sign up or wouldn't have known to sign up for appointments without um, this extra element of outreach, which is one of the main focuses in the office and one of, one of the really cool things about StoryCorps. Uh, Naomi and Felix both spend about 25% of their time in the office in Brooklyn. So they, we have a team, the mobile team has three facilitators. Vera is not here today, but she's in the office in Brooklyn. So they rotate through and their work mainly in the office in Brooklyn is outreach. We take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. 
And how long are you, I, I know you're here for five weeks, I believe. Is that a standard length of time to be at a site? Yes. Yes. Four to five weeks in each city. And then you're, you operate eight hours a day? You do eight interviews a day? Seven. Seven, we, seven yeah, interviews seven. and lunch. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> w it's a long day. We, and especially, you know, in D.C. now we're commuting on the train just like we do in New York. So we leave, uh, you know, about 9 o'clock in the morning and our last appointment finishes at 6.30. So we, and then we have databasing to do at the end of the day. So we don't leave the booth until about 7 or 7.30. And, and it's all very intense work, right? When people yeah. are in there, you really have to pay attention. Yeah. So, so what do you do on your time off? <laughs> because you're you're no. you're all you're all you're traveling the country yeah, as a we, group um, and and that must be we uh, it's interesting there's some days and each city also has a different feel to it it feels like there's so much to do in Washington D.C. that I don't want to just like lay around the house so I've been going to museums and going for walks and you know the weather has been beautiful uh -huh. but there are days when because it is such an emotionally tiring job some days that you just want to like lay on the couch and watch Netflix. <laughs> So it's a variation of different things. And every city that we're in, our living situation is different. So we're in partnership with a local public radio station. And WAMU has found us a fantastic house. We feel very fancy. We have a backyard and a porch and a front swing on the oh, front we, porch. We can come visit. We can, this is it's <laughs> really, really nice. So, um, so but, but it's not always like that. Felix and I in Las Cruces, um, New Mexico, this January, lived for a month in a pretty like mediocre hotel and <laughs> lots of <laughs> I ate so many frozen burritos in New Mexico so I'm happy that we have a full kitchen and a beautiful house now yeah, I'm getting spoiled and, and then in San Antonio we had our own apartment yeah. so in addition to going to different cities the living situation could be very different also whether that be like with the distance to the booth like in San Antonio we walked five minutes away from the booth um, in Las Cruces we drove for like 15 minutes here is like an hour commute but it is the metro so it's nice because there are some there's some pros of being in the metro you can after the booth we're already in the hill so we could like go out or go to dinner yeah. and we don't have to drive here which is fantastic have. Felix and Naomi are both native New Yorkers and we're a team that travels the country with two vehicles. So I, it makes, I am a Midwesterner, so I, like driving is no big deal for me. But these two, it makes me a little nervous. So I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful when they don't have to drive. She's right. <laughs> we, yeah, I shouldn't say anymore. <laughs> uh, so uh, now, one of the ways most people hear StoryCorps, I think, is uh, on NPR on Friday mornings. Uh, I, how many people again here listen to this on a regular basis? So a lot of people. Can you can you talk to us about the relationship of what you're recording? How do you select those those uh, vignettes? Those those uh, because I assume they're edited. And so, do you, when you're sitting there listening through all these stories, do you? When you hear a really great story, do you sort of mark it, or how do, how do you filter things? Well, we have a production department that um, that goes through the archive and finds what they're looking for for that particular date. I don't know, Talia, do you want to talk about this at all? <coughs> sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I think, Naomi, I think we have a total of about 600 produced pieces um, that have been generated for NPR. and. Our archive has 66,000 interviews in it. Um, the broadcast pieces are about two and a half minutes long and the interviews themselves are 40 minutes. So um, as you can tell, it's a very, very small percentage of our archive that currently um, is made available to the public to hear, which is something that we in the archive at StoryCorps are working very difficult, we're working very hard to change um, with the generous partnership of the American Folklife Center which is the only place that you can currently go to and listen to interviews in full. Um, so the way that the production department has a few different priorities. Um, we want to, in producing pieces, we want to represent um, diverse populations and also diverse kinds of pairings of people, so not have every single broadcast that goes on NPR be a, a grandfather you know, giving sound advice to his grandson, like trying to have different dimensions, different kinds of relationships. 
and different kinds of stories. Um, and we also do some work to, or the production department rather, which is not um, my area of expertise, try and um, often find um, kind of untold stories or kind of lesser known historical events that might relate to something that's in the news. So I remember uh, we did a piece on Orangeburg where there was a, 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 a bunch of people killed in a civil rights protest um, in South Carolina. Orangeburg where? Uh, South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay. Um, and uh, that was something um, that, you know, is not a story that a lot of people know about, but is related to a lot of um, kind of better known historical events. Um, so that's something that we do, um, or that our production department does rather. But then when these folks are listening to interviews in um, the booth, uh, there's kind of different standards that they, or not standards, but diff just different things that they're keeping their ear out for, which is uh, kind of in not just interesting content, but well-told stories, um, you know, people who have particularly compelling voices or something. And it, you know, we never want to say that, you know, a certain story is better than another story, because especially from an archival perspective, like even a kind of dryly told story has valuable kind of evidentiary information or things like that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, I don't know. I do have a couple of our broadcasts that were um, recorded on the mobile tour set up if you want to play one. Um, and if anybody's interested in hearing a story, we'd be happy to do that. It looks, I see some nods. Yeah, okay. yeah. Let's, let's get a sample. Pardon me. This was um, recorded in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, our mobile tour was there in 2015, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, this is a father and son pairing, Albert and Aiden Sykes. This is one of my favorites. Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out. The first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle and he was like, Here's your baby. That was the most proud moment of my life. Don't tell your brothers, because it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want the painting to look like at the end, but also knowing you can't control the paint strokes. You know, the fear was just, I got to bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say Black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So, Dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I take you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together. But also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? Yes, I understand that. Yeah, and so that's how you gotta think. You decide that you wanna be a cab driver, then you gotta be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember about my dad. Well, you said it like I'm on the way out of here or like I'm already gone. So, Dad, what are your dreams for me? My dream is for you to live out your dreams. It's an old proverb that talks about when children are born, children come out with their fists closed because that's where they keep all their gifts. And as you grow, your hands learn to unfold because you're learning to release your gifts to the world. And so for the rest of your life, I want to see you live with your hands unfolded. I think that's a good example of one that's uh, obviously compelling, but the dynamic between the two of them um, is really what the story is. The relationship is the story. Mm -hmm. And that was a straight conversation. You didn't 
Uh, do, do you sometimes take a longer conversation and edit oh, it down? Oh, that was highly edited. Yeah. I mean, that was that, highly edited. That was hours and hours and hours of editing. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was a four, at least a forty-minute conversation to begin with. I know it sounds like it sounds like they were just talking naturally, but that's the magic of the StoryCorps editing, the production team. I mean, mm -hmm. endless hours of editing. Not to say that the conversation, I'm sure, like if you listen to the full um, interview, it would probably entertain us and like touch us the whole way through. That's mm -hmm. what I imagine. But y we couldn't play a 40 minute conversation on morning edition. So, <laughs> right. so you distill it down. Exactly. Into yeah, I wish there was some, none of us are um, directly in the production department. Naomi and Felix, when they're in the office, they do um, first cuts on pieces that they, um, Mm -hmm. are assigned to. That's another one of their duties when they're in the office. So they can speak a bit more about that possibly, but um, but we don't have a representative from our production department here, unfortunately. Now, do you want to say anything about your experience in uh, production, Felix? Um, production's really fun. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we basically get assigned once a week um, to edit uh, first cut. So sometimes production interviews can be 40 minutes, but sometimes it could be longer, 60 minutes, 75 minutes. And the first cut is basically um, listening through the story and really seeing like what kind of theme do you really hear in the story that's the most compelling, or like what do you s what sparks what sparks at you, or like kind of whatever um, emotion that you're feeling from that first. Um, listening and then you edit it to a theme and then with the producer that is um helping you with the edit for that shift um will um pretty much listen to it and just have some suggestions and if it gets um green lit then it goes into the production meeting where they talk about it even further about whether they should keep on editing it or cutting it so forth hmm, interesting now i i want to highlight the, the mobile booth, as long as we have you all here. But since, <coughs> since Talia is here, I wondered if you could say a few words about StoryCorps Me and the app. Sure, um, so that's a big, uh, has been kind of a sea change at the organization. Um, we created a mobile recording app um, kind of as the result of Ted's, uh, Dave rather, Dave the founder of StoryCorps winning the Ted Prize um, and it's, uh, available for um, all manner of mobile device. Um, you can go to the App Store and download it. Um, and basically it, I think the original idea was to have it be kind of a quote unquote a digital facilitator, not that anything could ever replace the work that these <laughs> magical people do. Um, but um, it has a built in recorder and question generator. Um, so if you're somewhere where you're unavailable to come to record with StoryCorps, um, if you have a really great conversation at StoryCorps and want to keep talking to other folks in your family, all of these other things, you can just, um, you know, use your mobile phone, record on it, and then it uh, is uploaded um, kind of via SoundCloud and sent directly to the collection at the AFC. To, to the archive here, right? Yeah. And a lot of people are using this, right? Yeah. Uh, a little bird told me that there were 83,000 interviews on the site uh, as of this morning. Um, they're very different from the interviews that we record actually through the booth. They tend to be quite short um, often. One thing that's really great, and you saw like a second of the booth in the video, um, the sound quality is wonderful. They're like very, the booths that we have are really nicely soundproofed. We have really good equipment. They sound really good. Um, and just the fact that you're not sitting around in your living room or your high school cafeteria or wherever it is kind of gives a gravity to the interview that doesn't necessarily come with the interviews on the app. Um, so there are so I mean, which isn't to say that they aren't also important or meaningful or any number of other things. They just tend to be shorter and, and a bit different. Um, but they're also all accessible to be listened to on story at storycore.me. Okay, and uh, so people can visit them through your website. Yeah, through the story, just mm -hmm. through storycore.me. Okay, um, and at this point, maybe we can take a few questions from the audience. What are people curious about? And we have a mic. Yeah. Oh yes, I'm sorry. We we have a, a roving mic. Oh, we'll start. We'll get to you then. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yep. I wondered what kind of um, guidance you give the interviewers at the beginning of their session with regard to, um, you know, kinds of questions to ask or ways to sort of ask follow-up questions, things like that. A lot of the preparation takes place uh, weeks in advance when our team calls you. If you have an appointment, you get a phone call, and we always ask, do you have an idea of what you're going to talk about? And then we do have a list of great questions. Um, they're called StoryCorps Great Questions. So they're types of things like, how would you like to be remembered? Or who has been the kindest to you in your life? So people aren't required to use these questions, but they're really good um, suggested questions as conversation starters. But once you're in the booth, we usually tell people to, it's great to have questions in front of you as an idea, but you know what, like toss them out the window if your partner says something that interests you and follow up. I think the most important thing is to listen to what they're saying and to follow up. Um, sometimes we get, oh, fairly regularly on the mobile tour, we have um, young folks coming in interviewing their grandparents, so it's like a 12-year-old, and a lot of times they get really stuck on their questions and they think like, oh, grandma just said something really interesting, but I have to ask this question next. So it's kind of the same recommendation for anybody, like follow up with something that interests you. Don't get too um, set on asking the next question on your list. I, I think there's a question right there. I uh, interviewed um, when uh, StoryCorps was uh, on the Madison uh, a number of years ago, and we were a little bit nervous. I was telling stories about the <laughs> library. Um, and so we wore our oldest clothes. And I mean, when we had our pictures taken, uh, and then several years later, I found myself um, up on, uh, on the web in, in this disastrous looking uh, uh, shirt. And I didn't know if, um, if you regularly put them up or if it was because I saw on a blog, StoryCorps blog, Connie Carter said she was coming back uh, after 50 years at the Library of Congress, but guess what? She was back in 15 minutes with chocolate chip cookies <laughs> because her mother uh, went to school with the mother of the chocolate chip cookie. And so I don't know <laughs> if it was associated with the blog or do, or do you naturally have of people's pictures up on, um, on the web. I'm not sure exactly where you saw your photo, and I apologize if that was a surprise. <laughs> but, um, I know it used to be commonplace that we were just really excited about our participants. We used to post all of our participant photos on the mobile tour on like a Flickr page, but we have stopped doing that. Um, but it's also possible that it was there was a StoryCorps blog, and you may have been featured on the StoryCorps blog. So um, that's possible. It's not. Yeah. It, it it's not usual. No, it's not <laughs> usual. But if you do, it, so our the release form that you sign if you want to give a copy to the Library of Congress and to StoryCorps is called our general release form. And if you sign the general release form, it does mean that we are able to post your photo. So. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure I did. I'm sure I did sign the. Um, <laughs> But yeah. I'm not sure. It's, it would, yeah. it's hard for me to say if I don't know exactly where you saw your photo. But I, I'm sorry. And no, we, no. We, I, um, yeah. we, we <laughs> tend to tell people now, like, your photo will be taken. So where, whatever you'd like your photo be taken in. Because yeah. a lot of times people are like, oh, I didn't know that you were going to take my picture. <laughs> the question I have is for the collections. If you want to go to the American Folklife Center and you... Do you have to remember the name of that particular child and his father? Or can you just say, I want something on family relationships in the South? What Are you using index terms for the Library of Congress, or what are you doing? Yes, yes, we could cr cross-index them. And, and some of our archivists are here, and I should turn it over to them for, for um, better explanations. But do, do you want to talk a little bit about how um, things are indexed? Sure, yeah. Um, every interview has, uh, and actually um, uh, Naomi and Felix can speak to this too because they do a lot of our kind of on-the-fly archiving, um, but every interview is archived with a description, um, a kind of summary of the handwritten notes that they take that are time-coded throughout the course of the interview, and we have a set of keywords as well, um, both fixed vocabulary and kind of like um, optional kind of whatever terms seem applicable. Um, 
that uh, these folks can apply. And then um, when we're searching the collection, we have a lot of kind of versatility and you know different kinds of ways that we can cross index things or things like that. Um, the collection, as I mentioned, is very very large. So if you were you know to come in and look for the Sykes interview and know only that it was about you know a family in the South, it would probably take a bit of digging. Um, but thankfully, like obviously, the staff at the AFC is extremely familiar with what we have. Do y'all want to uh, say more about it? Yeah. So some of the things that we do at the end of the interview too is um, if they mention someone often throughout the interview, we tell them to write the name down so they could be part of the keywords. Uh, some of our keywords are also places, um, famous people, and then we do also have like a set of keywords that are already prefixed in um, when we're databasing. And there are things like holidays or um, health, et cetera. So if you have like some general idea, you could put that in. And then from there, you might have another idea like, oh, maybe I'm, I want to learn a little bit more about Vietnam. or And then from Vietnam, oh, but maybe I want to learn also about Vietnam and home. And then you could write home. And then j from there, it gets more specific to what interviews are out there. Um, Carl had a question. Well, one of the appealing things about the uh, Friday morning broadcast is you do get these little gems, uh, each one individual. But I've wondered, especially now that I've learned how carefully the collection as a whole is structured through these outreach activities and looking for underrepresented classes, as to whether yet scholars have come along to try to get at generalizations or findings, shall we say, that represent groups or classes of interviews rather than these little individual gems? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can, I mean, I can answer a little bit uh, just about what researchers have been doing with the collection so far. Actually, a lot of the research interest in the collection is linguistic. Um, people who are more interested in it as uh, just a tremendous kind of mine of people talking. Um, so people who want to do kind of natural language processing, that kind of thing, um, are really, really interested in working with it. Um, and there have been, um, and I mean, people will kind of take, tend to take cross sections of it rather than looking at it overarching. So we've had a lot of people, we um, have a partnership with the National September 11th Memorial and Museum, and we've had a lot of folks come in to look at kind of how people talk about 9-11 and the conventions and StoryCorps interviews versus in other kinds of oral histories or oral narratives. So um, that's the kind of stuff that people have been doing. But at this point, it's so large that no one has really come in to kind of be like, this is the nature of what is being done in a StoryCorps interview that isn't um, represented elsewhere. I remember um, when I was working in the office, there was a fantastic presentation from a researcher from Harvard who she for I think sh for two years she studied only 22 interviews. They were all from teachers talking to teachers, um, and she wanted to know specifically about that relationship of how do teachers talk to each other about teaching. But she spent two years because. Each of the 22 interviews was about 40 minutes. She transcribed each of those conversations word for word. And if you're talking about transcribing a 40 minute interview, that's pages and pages. It's a lot of text. A lot of work. Um, so that, yeah, that's, I, I mean, I just remember that stuck out in my mind. The, just like a tiny bit of um, our archive creates a ton of data. And also I think the initiatives sort of have l larger groupings of stories in that way. So, you know, the ones that are broadcast through Historias or our different initiatives might be those little gems that you're talking about, but we also check off um, in our archiving work if a, if a interview qual qualifies for one of those initiatives. And then if I guess you were looking for larger groupings of stories, you could just look at the entire initiative. Oh, and just to clarify, Historias is our initiative where we um, collect and archive stories of Latinos or Latinas or Hispanics all across America. And in addition to archiving it in the Library of Congress, we archive uh, these stories into the University of Texas Benson collection. Do, do you want to say a few words about 
upcoming initiatives, because you're doing, you're doing some very interesting work in the future. We've been concentrating on today and yesterday, but what's coming up for StoryCorps? Yeah, we have a new project that just launched called the StoryCorps Justice Project. Um, and we are, well, our next stop after Washington DC is Baltimore. And we, as, a, as the mobile tour, we are doing our first work with the Justice Project um, in Baltimore. And I, I'm, I shouldn't say too much because I don't know, uh, maybe tell, do you have the language to describe what we're doing? Um, we're working, uh, as far as I understand, we're working to record the stories of folks who are previously incarcerated. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, it's specifically focused on jails and um, kind of jails as opposed to prisons and the roles that those play in communities and kind of in general in the larger structure of mass incarceration in this country. Um, it's a explicitly an advocacy project, which is a little bit different for us. Um, but it is gonna be, we're really excited about it and um, I think it's gonna yield some really tremendous, um, tremendous stories. We have another initiative that we haven't mentioned so far, um, which is our legacy initiative, which works with um, folks who are dealing with life-threatening illnesses and other kinds of conditions. Um, it does a lot of work with hospice organizations and those interviews are a little bit different from the ones that we record in the mobile booth because what we actually do is train staff at those different organizations to go out and record interviews like in people's homes because mostly, because many of the folks who are eligible to participate in Legacy are not necessarily mobile or able to come to the booth. So this kind of empowers the people who are already working with them to go out and record interviews with them. Um, and it's a really great project and we've recorded a lot of really, really fascinating content through that. Uh, oh, yes? So I'm wondering, you know, everybody has these uh, life stories of people that their family's with, and maybe they don't have a chance uh, to get to be in the mobile booth, but they, they want to be able to record those life stories and do what you guys kind of do. Uh, do you guys have any, other than the app, is there any program to sort of empower people to make their own oral history within their family? Is it StoryCorps Me? Oh, oh, other well, than the app, yeah. The, yeah, the app Sorry. and StoryCorps Me. Yeah. The StoryCorps Me is just the online platform for the app, but really the bottom line is, and I hope that that's the message that StoryCorps has spread, is that it's important to record conversations of those that you love and the people who are closest to you. So the bottom line is record the story. Like, I, um, besides doing the work that we're doing and push putting the app out into the world, um, there isn't a, a push to um, spread oral history, um, but I, I do hope that people are inspired when they hear um, the Friday morning broadcast to sit down and record a conversation. You don't have to be at one of our recording booths. You don't have to use our app to preserve a, a story of a loved one. But for years you've been, uh, have you not been situated outside prisons? I mean, was it, I, I thought, We've you know, sometimes libraries, banks, uh, uh, prisons. I thought that you um, had done prisons quite from the beginning. We've recorded um, a few at prisons, but I think it's really, there's a lot of logistical issues that come up when we've tried to partner with prisons and jails. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of legal ramifications. So no, we, I know of one broadcast in particular that was recorded at a, a facility outside of Chicago, um, but I, from my knowledge, we haven't done a lot of recording at prisons. Yeah. Y yes? Just quickly, your favorite story and who would you interview? Uh, I, well, that's easy for me. I'll go first. I've already interviewed both my mother and my father. Um, I would love to interview my brother. That hasn't happened yet, but it will happen within the next year, I'm sure. My favorite story that I've recorded um, I mean, there's so many to choose from, but one that will always stick in my mind, um, and I don't remember if Felix was with me that day, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, I recorded a conversation with two mu street musicians, and like elderly, just like amazing people in Las Cruces, like very well known in the community, and it was just fantastic to hear them talk to each other, but also like they, play, they brought in their guitars and played music. I, people play music fairly regularly in the booth. Um, it's not something that we necessarily tell them to bring in their instruments, but 
before we came to DC, we were in Nashville, and there was a lot of music in the booth. A woman wore a um, washboard tie one day to the booth and played and sang. <laughs> that was one of it's one of my favorite things is when people sing in the booth. So I, those stick out in my memory. Felix. Um, since you're like talking about musical instruments, um, two of my favorite things, like when I uh, when I interview, is like one is like when it involves children because they they sometimes they surprise me every time with uh, whether they're interviewing or whether they be the storyteller. Um, and there was this one uh, child in particular. I think this was in San Antonio, and he um, spe he specifically plays the accordion. He is eight years old, and he um, plays um, this type of music called conjunto, and it's a very old um, it's an old um, theme of music, um, usually of in the Mexican community. And he's the youngest person who plays in the band uh, uh, and um, in the band and is learning conjunto and learning accordion. And I think the next old, the next youngest is like in their 60s. <laughs> so like he is like the very very young, and he just played the whole time. He barely he barely said a word or two, and he's like, "Can I play?" <laughs> da, 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 da. And he's like, "Can I play another song? Can I play another?" So basically, the whole interview was him playing the accordion, and it just showed. He's like, um, one of the things that he learned was you have to practice every day, or else I won't be good. And like having that value already, like in his mind and seeing like what the potential is for him in the future. It was just a wonderful interview. So who yeah. would you interview? Who would I interview? I, I think I would interview, I haven't interviewed my mom yet, so <laughs> that'd be interesting. And Naomi? I don't have a favorite, but one that stuck out to me from this trip was, um, this woman who was doing genealogy research on her family and um, sort of was not reunited because they'd only heard about each other a little bit through childhood. They never actually met with her cousin who was one of the first um, famous uh, classical African-American concert pianists and then like traveled the world doing all these things and she was able to you know, meet back up with him, and he was a really big influence in her son's life now, and it was just like a whole full circle type of interview that was really touching, and then I did a little bit of research about him after, and it was just really impressive, and I was really excited, <laughs> but I also love when kids come in, um, and I would, uh, I would interview a family member. I, there's so many people I want to hear about. My, my mom, my brother, I guess. <laughs> I think, Talia, you can answer this question, too. What's your favorite story in the archive? <laughs> oh my goodness, um, there's so, so many, um, but there's one that I always, that I just always think of whenever ask, someone asks me what my favorite interview is, which is like, kind of like, related to people being unexpected. Um, uh, it came in through one of our, actually through Legacy Initiative, um, and you know, and there's a picture of this kind of mild-mannered looking old lady, and she talks about, uh, being a NASCAR driver, <laughs> like before, <laughs> like or like a stock car racer, like before NASCAR was a thing, when when like stock car racing was still really kind of like basically criminal, um, and just like how she just like was a champ um, and was like beating all these men, and like you know her husband was like you can't drive that fast, and she's like yes I can, um, so I really love that one, um, and I don't know who I'd want to interview. I've You've interviewed a lot of people already. I've interviewed a lot of people already, so. Okay, you might be TBA. next. On, on that note, I want to thank all of you for coming. This has been great. You're here for another three weeks? Yes. And um, I know the booth isn't really open for tours, but if people want to see the booth, it's just behind the uh, in the rear of the Jefferson Building. We're in the Jefferson Building now, so if you walk around uh, they'll be set up. You're off. You get Tuesdays and yeah, Thursdays Tuesdays and Thursdays, Thursdays are off. not recording days. And other than that, there's someone there. So uh, again, thank you all for coming, and thanks StoryCorps for being here. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.